Hello everyone, today we're going to discuss anti-vaxxers and the COVID-19 vaccine. So let's jump right in. It would be a comical understatement to say that some people have put out some misinformation regarding COVID-19 and the new vaccine. Indeed, tragically uninformed people using a variety of social media platforms, from Twitter to Facebook to YouTube, have spread considerable amounts of misinformation. And not just them, radio hosts, national news networks, and even our politicians have downplayed or totally rejected the effects of the current coronavirus SARS-CoV-2, leading to the deaths of, at this time of recording, over 400,000 people just in the United States. More than 4,000 virus-induced deaths are occurring in this country per day. That's more deaths per day due to the coronavirus than people who died daily during World War II. In some occasions, deaths and injuries were caused by the misinformation itself, like when ex-President Trump promoted hydroxychloroquine, which is ineffective against COVID-19, leading to people taking the drug that didn't help and in some cases made it worse. Or when he uh, sarcastically suggested injecting disinfectants as a potential treatment, which was followed by people drinking actual bleach or other disinfectants. For goodness sake, do not drink bleach. This insane loss of life should be a global embarrassment, and for some countries, it is. For others, the virus is still considered a hoax, or at the very least overblown, even after almost a year into the pandemic. We even have instances where people were dying from COVID-19 while in denial of its existence. Imagine being a nurse taking care of someone who is deadly ill while they are convinced that the virus that is killing them isn't real, that you are lying to them and part of some conspiracy. It sounds like an episode from the Twilight Zone, but for some this has been real life. This is a dangerous and in many people's cases downright deadly way to approach the virus. You might be less vulnerable, but your grandparents have a far greater mortality risk. But still, it isn't just old people who die. People who think that a mortality rate of about 1% for the general population is not a big deal, should be reminded that, by the law of large numbers, that would still mean that within a country like the US with 300 million people, the virus could still end up causing 3 million deaths, which include people of all ages. And we are already approaching half a million deaths due to COVID-19 in the US after less than a year, at least the ones that are accounted for. Another common point of misinformation is that the death toll is overestimated but the medical experts agree that the number is, if anything, an underestimate. There was also this claim that the CDC supposedly admitted that only 6% of the record deaths in the U.S. were due to COVID-19, while the other 94% died of other causes. This claim is completely false. The 94% were instances of comorbidity, wherein other underlying conditions contributed to the death in addition to COVID-19. For the 6% of the deaths, COVID-19 was the only cause mentioned. This isn't unique to COVID-19 either. Deaths caused by AIDS or cancer, or any other disease for that matter, are also often accompanied by several other ailments. But even the death count doesn't provide a complete picture. People who don't get COVID-19 can still die due to the pandemic. The pandemic puts a strain on the healthcare system such that other people with different ailments may not get the right treatment in time. And it isn't just about deaths. For every death from COVID-19, 19 more people still require hospitalization to survive. Of these 19, 18 will have permanent heart damage, 10 will have permanent lung damage, 3 will have strokes, 2 will have neurological damage causing chronic weakness and loss of coordination, and 2 will have neurological damage that causes a loss of cognitive function. If you care about others, then you should wear a mask and socially distance. Due to the way the virus spreads, your actions could mean the difference of hundreds or even thousands of lives. Even if you don't care about others, those practices still protect you from getting COVID-19. 
While social distancing and mask wearing did slow down the spread of the virus, it became clear to the experts that widespread vaccination would eventually be needed to put an end to the pandemic. Now, a pharmaceutical company known as Pfizer has developed a vaccine to combat COVID-19 in record time. Of course, the anti-vaxxers have come out in force against the vaccine, spreading all manner of misinformation. The anti-vax mentality is a major issue in general, not just in regards to the current pandemic. Vaccines are one of the major medical achievements in history, which prevents 2-3 to three million deaths per year and could prevent an additional 1.5 million deaths annually. One out of seven deaths among young children, mostly occurring in the developing world, could be prevented with vaccines. To counter anti-vaxxers and dispel any concerns and questions people might have, we've brought in Doc Savage, who's been on this channel before. We're going to ask him some questions. First, hello Doc. What are your qualifications in this area? It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me back onto the channel. So first qualification is medical microbiology uh, and my undergraduate degree from my hometown in Edinburgh and subsequently I studied uh, PhD at uh, the uh, School of Biochemistry Guy's Hospital in London. Uh, after that I did two postdoctoral fellowships in research and development and uh, then moved into the industry where I've been developing various things, uh, vaccines and biological drugs, for the last couple of decades. So, people tend to trust the experts when there is transparency. So, could you please uh, disclose any conflicts of interest you might have? It's a, it's a really good point. And um, I'm a freelance independent consultant. <clears throat> which means I've worked for a lot of the big and medium sized and some of the small biotech companies uh, around the world. Um, I don't have any active conflicts of interest because I'm not employed by any of them at present. But it's important to point out that what I'm doing here today is speaking generally about vaccines and in some instances more specifically about individual vaccine products but I'm not endorsing any of these products or the technologies used to develop them. I'm speaking as a scientist and uh, independently in that respect. Next, I'd like to ask you some questions about vaccines generally and then about the COVID vaccine specifically. There are different types of vaccines. Some contain live viruses, others are inactivated, and others contain only pieces of the germ. How do vaccines in general work uh, why do we have different types of vaccines? What type of vaccine is the one made by Pfizer? And how does the Pfizer vaccine work? Got it. Right. <laughs> um, I'll try and answer this in a period shorter than my whole career. Because uh, that's really what I've been <laughs> doing. Um, how do they work to begin with? Essentially, what you need to do with a vaccine is convince... Uh, the organism, us in this case, that it's already experienced the pathogen, the bacteria or virus or fungus or, or entity that will cause the problem. To do that, you need to introduce an antigen derived from that pathogen. What does that mean? An antigen is a patterned molecule that is characteristic of the pathogen and doesn't occur in you. When you administer that and there's a suitable response to it, your body is already primed to respond to the pathogen if you're ever exposed to it. So you're ready to go. Your body has made the response and it's on the shelf ready to be deployed. How the antigen is delivered varies depending upon what works, quite frankly. There's the natural selective effect of research such that vaccine experimental types that are effective against particular conditions tend to be adopted and advanced based on development therefrom. There are many different types. The original vaccine uh, for chickenpox, sorry, for smallpox, was a different type 
of related virus, the cowpox virus, that is like the smallpox virus enough to generate a response that protects against both. So that's an extreme case. Some are killed bacteria or viruses, but much more often now, uh, subunit vaccines are made where a very specific antigen is purified and formulated and administered. Uh, it's often made without the original pathogen ever being present so that it's much safer. And the response is typically much more focused on what we would call immunodominant um, uh, antigens. Meaning, in most cases, like in the COVID case, you don't need to make an immune response against the whole virus in order to prevent infection. You just have to make a response against the part that uh, is most responsible for one critical aspect of the infectious process. So different vaccines for different conditions and different types of pathogen. Um, and the, the list that was included is pretty comprehensive there. The Pfizer vaccine, there was a spe specific requ uh, request to discuss that. The COVID vaccine made by Pfizer is an mRNA vaccine. So in this case, instead of administering an antigen, what is administered is a message made out of ribonucleic acid that programs your cells to make part of this antigen and your body will then respond to it. So it's the same overall process, but instead of giving the the immune signal, it gives a message that makes that signal happen. So what is the efficacy of vaccines? Like we have heard that the new vaccine is 95% effective, which is good, but we have also seen that some flu vaccines are only 28% effective. This could make some people wonder why they should even take it. So could you explain what determines the minimal efficacy needed for a vaccine such that sometimes 28% is still good enough? It's a, again, it's, a, it's an interesting and complex question and there is no single answer to the, uh, the question how efficacious are vaccines. Of course, we're always targeting 100% efficacy and 100% safety. And in any population, these are never an achievable goal. Um, there are a couple of things that are important to consider. One is the vaccine itself. One is the, uh, the target of the vaccine and whether that is fixed or whether it's moving and if it's moving, how quickly. And the immunocompetence of the population. So a, a proportion of the population are not vaccine, vaccine protectable as a function of their own immune systems not really being highly functional. It's a small proportion of the population. Immune function also tends to tail off as people reach extreme old age, and it's also absent in extreme young age. So there's a variation across people. But the, the key point here is, uh, I think, related to flu and some of the low efficacy numbers that people throw around. Flu is an interesting case because it's a, an RNA virus that has a segmented genome and also uh, has uh, versions present in multiple different animal species and the, the tendency to skip from one to another. All of that combined means that the flu virus that is currently circulating in various parts of the world may or may not be the one that's present in a year's time from now. And as it takes time to make a vaccine, we're always trying to anticipate what the future flu will look like. And sometimes we get it really, really accurate and sometimes we don't. And that's why the flu vaccine efficacy is lower than you would typically expect or typically tolerate. But a 28 to 30% efficacy is not good enough, but it's also 30% better than no efficacy. And even reducing the vulnerable population by a small proportion is important. And also, 
getting a repertoire of immune responses against flu is very valuable because while the, vi the virus changes, it, it will change within certain parameters. So if you've had multiple flu vaccines up to now, each of which give you some degree of protection against the current strain, you're better and you're in a better situation than you would be if you were um, uh, unsophisticated in terms of your, your immune response available. So uh, I recommend getting it. I recommend getting it every year. I get the flu vaccine every year. In terms of the COVID vaccine, COVID is changing and is expected to change and that is going to happen. And I don't know whether there will be an updated vaccine, although I would expect there to be uh, in a seasonal sense. Many people are concerned about adverse side effects, which makes them doubt whether they should take the vaccine at all. Could you explain what the risks are regarding the side effects and compare them to the risks of not being vaccinated? Absolutely, and this is a really good point. And I think anybody is perfectly justified in being concerned about anything that's being administered to their body. Um, before getting into the real meat of the answer, to speak generally, the, the medical and vaccines industry in particular is extremely highly regulated. And the reason for that is we're preparing things that are biological, that are then injected into healthy people. So there's no, does it help you more than it hurts you? You have to get it right. And um, that's why the FDA and other organizations are so stringent about this kind of thing. The quality requirements for clinical use are, are very significant and a very high, burden, uh, very high um, uh, bar to clear. In terms of safety and efficacy, there's a lot of testing that goes into that. And in each vaccine that I've ever seen, including the COVID ones, the risk of not vaccinating is dramatically higher than the risk of vaccinating. And I'll be very clear about this. If you give any medical intervention to a big enough population, some people will respond poorly to it. Some people will have an extreme reaction to it, but we're talking about fractions of 1% in comparison to an illness, which in the case of COVID kills one in a hundred people and dramatically more than that in certain populations. So no medicine or vaccine is ever a hundred percent effective or a hundred percent safe. But in terms of risk versus reward, I would strongly favor prevention rather than the risk of going through the natural infection. So is mercury or aluminum added to vaccines? And if so, why and do these cause harm? This is a, a really interesting question and a, a common trope within the anti-vaccine community, like many of the others, based on a grain of truth but uh, let's unpack it a little bit. So the mercury claims come from the previous inclusion of a compound called thimerosal, which is uh, a mercury salt. It's not mercury metal, it's an ethyl mercury salt that was used uh, as a preservative, as an antibacterial and fungal uh, agent to um, maintain vaccines on the shelf. Uh, it was also used as merthiolate in the, in the US as an antiseptic. Um, and it's not included in pediatric vaccines in the US since uh, I think the late 1990s. So for almost 20 years that's been. And it's been gone because it was essentially no longer required. As uh, manufacturing technology developed and testing technology developed, it was possible to transition from aseptic processes, which were clean but not sterile, to sterile processes, such that we know there's no bacteria or fungal contamination in the final product. Therefore, there's no need for a preservative for it. 
but at no time was mercury included in vaccines and ethyl mercury which is uh, the constituent part of thimerosal is dramatically as in orders of magnitude less toxic than methyl mercury or elemental mercury so uh, it has been excluded from pediatric vaccines not based on uh, data related to harm but because it's not necessary anymore um, similar story with aluminum at no time was aluminum added to vaccines but uh, aluminum hydroxide or other salts of aluminum have been included as vaccine adjuvants an adjuvant is a a substance that causes minor localized irritation and stimulates the immune response against the antigen that you're administering. Um, again, it's not elemental uh, aluminum and has been included because it's highly functional and isn't associated with uh, any, any pathology. Um, there have been claims about either or both or other components of vaccines causing autism and without expanding upon that too much none of the data support that claim um, and i realize i may have jumped into the next question so That's i'll right. end this response there but no mercury no aluminum thimerosal isn't in pediatric vaccines it's rarely included in other vaccines uh, aluminum hydroxide is as an adjuvant it helps vaccines to work and there are other adjuvants that don't include uh, either um, aluminum salts or other metal salts so is there any evidence that vaccines cause autism or any other major disorders uh, short answer no the the autism discussion and it's an ongoing one has been really problematic because none of the data support a causative link between uh, vaccine components or vaccine schedules and the uh, amount of autism we see in the community the tragedy is that while the data don't support that link the resulting data show a real clear uh, association between reduced vaccine uptake and increased infant mortality um, specifically among people who were not vaccinated with for instance the MMR vaccine so while we may think and in most instances this is true that measles is a trivial childhood infection for one in 500 people or slightly more it really really isn't uh, and the uptake, the reduced uptake in vaccine uh, resulted in several outbreaks with a real measured body count associated with them. People who are concerned about vaccines also tend to be concerned about genetically modified organisms, and this vaccine is based on a new method that sounds a lot like genetic modification. An mRNA molecule that reprograms your cells to make the spike protein, which in turn will cause the immune system to make antibodies against this protein, which is also on the real virus. Does this vaccine, or any other vaccine, transform or change our DNA? I love it when a question is so nuanced that I can give a one-word answer. And then, of course, extrapolate on it. The, the one-word answer is no. Um, molecular biology, uh, genetic manipulation, PCR, cloning are technologies that we're getting quite good at. But to change the genome of a cell or an organism of, of the nature that we are is a really complex undertaking. Vaccines don't do that. GMOs don't do that. Um, Although it would be kind of neat if they did. And if you ate a tuna salad, you developed the ability to swim at 60 miles an hour, I would do that. <laughs> but that isn't a thing. Um, gene therapy is a thing, but it's not the same thing as vaccines. And mRNA uh, cannot slip into your genome and transform you into an X-Man. 
all it can do is send a message through a ribosome to make an antigen that your body then responds to. That's it, and that's all. Does the COVID vaccine, or vaccines generally, contain aborted fetal tissue? Again, uh, short answer to the question, no. Um, because some vaccines require a virus to actually be grown, there is a requirement for human cells. And the fetal tissue angle comes back to a cell line called HEC293, which stands for human embryo kidney cell. This cell line, which is a cancer cell line, uh, was derived in 19, I think in the late 1960s, early 1970s, from uh, a, an aborted fetus. Um, and has been grown in culture and stored in cryo storage since then. So no part of any of the vaccines tested or developed using that cell line have aborted fetal tissue in them, but a human cell is required to grow some of the, some of the virus versions that are required for vaccine development. Uh, other cell types are used in other vaccines, for instance, uh, cell embryo fibroblasts, sorry, chick embryo fibroblasts from chickens are used in uh, culturing flu virus. And uh, again, instead of going to primary cells derived from eggs, we now use an immortalized cell line because it's an industrializable and scalable uh, method of growing vaccine virus. Uh, so, short answer, HEC293 cells are used in the testing and in the culture of some vaccine variants. There is no aborted fetal tissue, no requirement for abortions to happen for this or other vaccines to be developed, and very tight specifications as to the amount of host cell protein and or genetic material present in any clinical product. And by tight specifications, I mean sub parts per billion level. Uh, so barely, if it, if detectable at all. So, do the vaccines implant tracking technology in us? Again, a very short answer for this one. No, that, that isn't a thing. Um, the requirement or benefit of tracking people kind of breaks down when individuals are less important than how populations uh, behave. And most of us have smartphones, so it would be redundant even if we wanted to do it. Much more valuable to track your spending habits and your location based on your GPS enabled smart technology. Uh, so yeah, that's a short answer. No, we're not tracking via vaccines, although Vaccine batches are individually traceable as a function of the required regulations, such that every chemical, every piece of equipment, every individual involved down to the basic raw data is traceable based on the batch number of the, of the vaccine. Because we care and we're paying attention and if things go wrong, we want to be able to fix them. Have vaccines ever been part of a plot to kill people who couldn't be controlled by the government? Again, a really interesting and, and thematically potent question. In response to that, I'd have to say that I don't know of any instance where that has happened, but I know of many instances where it has been suggested. So briefly, if vaccines were uh, a genocidal impetus for populations, there would be data to demonstrate that. And the data that I, I'm looking at is really the opposite of that. People who are vaccinated tend to uh, be healthier and live longer, better, happier lives as a result of not dying in infancy. However, it's a really important point that humane individuals uh, have to consider that medicine has been usurped by political ideology and fascism in the past 
and has been used <clears throat> as a tool of evil as recently as in the the Second World War against some of my ancestors and more recently in unethical medical experiments against African-American populations in the US and, and people in other places. That's why the ethical bodies that govern our industry are um, present to prevent or at least reduce as far as possible any misuse of the technologies and the uh, interventions that we have access to. But this is an ongoing discussion and an ongoing dialogue. And I am hopeful that by the time my time is done, things that were considered medically appropriate in my childhood will no longer be considered medically appropriate. For instance, things like artificially prolonging the lives of people in excruciating agony. I think that's inappropriate. But our culture and our ethical position at the moment is mostly that that's completely okay. Um, the reason I bring this up is none of these are fixed paradigms. These are cultural and socio-political evolutions, and they have to spring forth from a dialogue. Here's an example. Someone posited the idea that allowing infectious diseases to run their course in a population would selectively um, tune our population to be quote-unquote stronger by killing a bunch of people. That may be true. Uh, I don't actually agree that it is true, but let's assume that it is. If that is the case and we have the opportunity to minimize that harm by intervening, are we not morally obliged to minimize that harm? Uh, I think that we are, given the choice. And in response to the evolutionary discussion there, any dramatic selective pressure will by definition reduce the genetic variability of the surviving population. And as a result of that, make that population less robust to subsequent selective pressures. So in a long-term sense, it's not advantageous to select out the weak from the herd, quote unquote, weak from the herd, and, uh, and thin people in that, in that way. Uh, interestingly, if people are uh, interested in seeing how this has actually played out over history, look up the CCR5 Delta 32 mutation and uh, cross-reference that to both HIV and um, having ancestors who didn't die of plague. And also check out the, um, uh, the sickle cell thalassemia um, mutation and why having that is actually kind of good if malaria coexists with you in your population. Was the vaccine ever going to be sent through the mail? I'm not certain of, of the direction of this question, but I don't think the vaccine was ever going to be sent through the mail, as in the regular mail, to regular people. But distribution of vaccine batches and doses is a, a logistical challenge for all companies involved in a global effort like this. and. Uh, Vaccines are sent through regulated shipments every day. So not to individual people to self-administer, uh, but to clinics for distribution, absolutely. So is the vaccine going to turn us into cyborgs as Carrie Madej claims? Short answer, no. Uh, cyborgs are very cool uh, and all, but that isn't a thing that vaccine technology can do. Although if it was, I would probably be doing it. Uh, I do hope that implantable biotech becomes a thing to help people treat symptoms and monitor the conditions in, in real time and perhaps assist in motility. Um, so that's the 
That's the real answer, but the fun answer is I am a cyborg and my mission is to basically assimilate all of you homo sapiens. I, if I could, I probably would, but I can't, so I'm not doing that right now. We have heard about how vaccines are tested and trials spread over three phases. Could you explain how vaccines are tested for efficacy and safety and what happens during each phase? Sure. The initial phase of testing or phase zero is preclinical where animal tests are required and the gross safety of a product and how it uh, induces a, an immune response are tested during that phase, as are the distribution, pharmacokinetics and elimination of and bioavailability bio of the vaccine product. That's before it ever gets near a person. From phase one through three, there is basically an increase in skill from very limited trial sizes to a substantial population and an increase in uh, testing from basic safety in the early phases to safety and efficacy in phase three. The uh, details of this are nicely covered in Wikipedia and I think we can link to that which gives an idea of scale and purpose. Uh, from what I've seen, I think that's a pretty good source, but it, it basically lays this out in a level of detail that might be more accessible than a, a verbal response here. But the ultimate challenge is to demonstrate both safety and efficacy, meaning uh, is the product does the product do what we claim it does, as in, does it induce a protective immune response? And at the end of phase three, or presumptively at the end of phase two plus, we can make a claim that the vaccine is what we say it is, that it can be manufactured, and that it is both safe and efficacious in terms of a really specific immune response to a very specific pathogen. One thing that could be a cause for concern is how vaccines that can be politicized and result in more harm than good. We have seen this in 1976 when President Gerald Ford rushed a vaccine mass immunization program in response to a swine flu outbreak. It was quite apparent that Ford did this to boost his PR before the upcoming election. Recently we have seen similar instances where Donald Trump was eager to deliver a vaccine before the election. We have also seen that a vaccine in Russia was quickly approved based on preliminary data from phase one and two studies that were not published until nearly a month later. This was met with criticism from the scientific community. Do you have any remarks on this? Okay, it, it's always very tempting uh, and unwise to make proclamations about efficacy of new products. And when these things become politicized, very quickly, the data that drives the kind of interventions that we've been discussing goes out the window. So I'm really uncomfortable when that happens. In this instance, there's a global crisis that people have responded to. And the urgency of that has released resources and priority position in terms of the regulatory authorities that have allowed things to move quickly. Um, that's a, a function of urgency rather than reduced uh, stringency. And thankfully, we're in a position collectively as a population, uh, at least in the developed world, to be able to react to this in a way that we've never been able to do before. And that is a, a well understood, well regulated and uh, very nicely manufactured series of vaccines that can protect our most vulnerable populations. Vaccines usually take years to produce. So how is this one produced so quickly? 
Did they sacrifice the qualities of the experimental trials to speed up the process? Good question. Um, no, they really didn't do that. But in this case, the global industry and global governments, meaning the individual governments of multiple states, realized that there was a significant issue. And as a result of that, huge investment has been made in developing rapidly, as rapidly as possible, uh, a vaccine that could be manufactured at a scale to protect enough people to make this pandemic go away. And that kind of motivation should be considered equivalent to, for instance, World War II, where all of a country's resources were targeted into sustaining the population, but also fulfilling the requirements of the conflict. So while things have moved quickly, this is an offshoot of ongoing research into Corona Verity, resulting from previous outbreaks of viruses a lot like this. So we've been able to respond quickly as a result of that research and also the global requirement to perform quickly. And when resources are less concerning, it's possible to move things forward quite quickly. And that's what's happened. And I'm really impressed with the response. I think the question on everyone's mind is this, is the new vaccine in particular safe and effective? And how do we know this? Well, uh, I'll address the response more generally. How do we know that any vaccine is safe and effective? Two aspects are important. One is individual um, and quantitative assessment of protection, and the other is the population effect. In terms of the individual, we would look at serum, we would look at the proteins in that serum and their reactogenicity against certain bacterial or viral antigens, depending on the pathogen involved. In addition to that, uh, we'd look at the uh, cellular content, as in the white cell content and reactive uh, characteristics of that particular fraction of, of patient samples. Collectively, those give us an impression of the antibody response and the cell-mediated response, both of which are important. In terms of population, you look for a reduced level of spread, reduced level of morbidity and mortality associated with vaccine administration. And uh, from all of the data that I'm seeing related to both of these factors, all of the currently available vaccines against COVID-19 are really effective. So uh, on a personal level, I've had two doses of one of them. And I've recommended that my parents who are in their 80s have uh, also a full schedule of the one that's available for them, which is actually a different one to the one that's available for me. But again, I've looked at all of the data and I would recommend this to you, your mom and dad, your grandparents, uh, and so on. Consistent with one of the earlier answers, the risks associated with vaccination are very limited, whereas the risks are associated with propagating this particular infection are really considerable and risk versus reward it's an obvious answer to protect yourself and your family well thank you doc for taking the time to answer all these questions and to everyone else stay safe out there so thanks for watching and we'll see you next time